Center and also with the Department of Geology and Geophysics. And today is the second seminar, and uh, as I mentioned last time, <coughs> it is an, an honor for Steve Lab and the late John Bank for very prominent in water resources research. And today's speaker, I'm honored to introduce uh, Travis Ivan. And he's an associate professor with the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Management at CETA, which is a college of local agriculture and human resources. And his uh, area of research and teaching is tropical forestry and agroforestry. He has his bachelor from uh, Wake Forest University and master and PhD from Purdue. And, uh, uh, basically, he's uh, lead PI on a large project now with the title Sustainable Management of Agroecological Resources by Tribal Scientists, which is in short smart, I guess. <laughs> and today he will talk to us about CAPS, which is Conservation Agricultural Production. Um, okay, so this is uh, going to talk a little generally about the, the concept of conservation agricultural production systems, but the idea of building resilience into smallholder agriculture. Resilience seems to be kind of a new buzzword in sustainable agriculture, given the uh, kind of kinds of demands and pressures, especially with climate change, you're placing. Um, I want to start with acknowledgments first, and this is really not even everybody. I, this is everybody, everybody I could, all whose contact information and names I could pull up. So it's a big crew, a big team of people from the University of Hawaii, uh, really a um, you know multidisciplinary team, uh, a number of students. This is just the graduate students, not even the undergraduates are working on it. Our partners in India and Nepal, and there's additional partners who are still coming on board whose names aren't even really up here. So uh, the work that I'm going to present really is, is the obviously results of everybody's efforts. So this project is part of a larger program funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development. It's called Sustainable Agriculture and Natural Resource Management. Uh, cooperative Research Support Program. So anyone who's familiar with USAID research knows that this sort of crisp approach has been used for different topics in agriculture, but most of them have been sort of commodity-based. So it's been uh, the peanut crisp, or the sorghum crisp, or the IPM, uh, Integrated Pest Management crisp. So the, the sand run crisp is really one that looks more broadly at sustainable agriculture. Um, it's currently approaching the last year of its fourth phase, and each of those is a five-year program. So it's been around for about 20 years. Uh, and we, we already know uh, that the next phase will be very different because uh, USAID is kind of shifting focus to what's called sustainable intensification rather than just sustainable agriculture. And the focus is going to be on the countries that have been recognized uh, or categorized under their Feed the Future initiative. Um, the results of the third phase of the Sandrim uh, CRISP really coalesced sustainable agriculture practices or conservation agriculture practices around three kind of related and, and so are mutually supporting or synergistic practices. The first was minimum soil disturbance, so thinking about uh, re reduction in tillage and, and other kinds of soil disturbance. Uh, continuous organic soil cover, so whether you're using cover crops or crop residue management or other ways to keep the surface from being exposed to wind and to water erosion. And finally, appropriate crop rotation um, or um, uh, mixing crops both temporally and spatially to try to prevent the problems of one crop uh, both wearing out the soil as, for example, a continuous corn rotation would do or building up a pest and disease issue. So trying to get away from a monoculture cropping system at least in time. Um, the Sandrum Chris currently works in about 12 different countries around the world, covering uh, many different regions, uh, primarily tropical and subtropical. Uh, and so the project we're working in is in the South Asia region, which is India and Nepal. There's uh, the Caribbean, uh, 
South America, different regions of Africa, and Southeast Asia. Uh, the Feed the Future initiative in those countries are really focused and uh, heavily focused in Africa, so that's going to, it has been and continue to be a big focus for future USAID work in this area. Um, the goals of the, the SANREM CRISP are to improve the capacity of USAID and its partners to increase agricultural productivity in a sustainable manner. So that's not just crop productivity, but the underlying natural quality of the natural resources, especially the soil. Obviously, the benefit should go primarily to the, uh, the farmer, the producer himself, but also thinking about this as a way to feed more than just the, the house. It should go beyond just subsistence agriculture. It's a way to uh, build local capacity, local productive capacity uh, to feed people so that they don't have to rely upon um, imported food or food aid. Um, and really, to do that, that requires site-specific and culture-specific technologies. Technologies that have to be appropriate, not only for their capacity, but for their preferences. And so a participatory approach has really been promoted uh, to developing agricultural technology. No longer can we say, we develop these really nice technologies in the US, Canada, and Europe. We'll just export them around the world, and we'll tinker with them so that we can get them to fit within the local context. It really is starting with the farmers, what they perceive as the problems and needs, what kinds of technologies they prefer, what their capacity is, and then developing um, solutions in a participatory manner with them. So it also means getting off of the research station and onto the farm and making that really the locus of the work. Um, and also, once you get that, then the uh, scaling that up, disseminating that out and scaling that up. How do we get this from a few villages to hundreds of villages to you know, region or, or countrywide? And there's always this US benefit in there, which we won't really look at that again. <laughs> that's because it's a US agency. I don't know how that's about anyway. Um, so the goals of the phase four CRISP are to develop locally approved CAPs, what we call a conservation agriculture production system, looking at these three inter uh, or mutually beneficial practices as part of an integrated system to try to increase food production, improve soil quality as the primary natural resource that uh, is necessary to uh, support good agriculture, and to improve household livelihoods. And so there's a focus not just on the economic impacts of that, but also on the uh, gender-specific uh, implications. So USAID projects now in this area have to have an explicit focus on improving the role of women in uh, their uh, capacity and decision making. Um, so that is across the board, no matter what the projects are, there has to be an explicit focus on how this affects women with the goal of improving their status recognizing that their ability to make decisions and participate in household community decisions, their education, their well-being is vital for uh, small for, for development. And also strengthening social and technological networks. In this one in particular, there, there is a, a part of the focus should be on where are the farmers getting their knowledge and information, right? Who's, who's giving them, you know, obviously they learn, they know a lot on their own, they talk to each other, who else do they talk to? Who else is, you know, sort of uh, working with them to develop or, or giving them advice and information? Is it the seed dealer? Is it the chemical, the guy selling fertilizers? Is it local extension agents? Is it uh, whoever, you know? Where are they getting this information from? Uh, how much are uh, NGOs and universities or government ministries involved in what they do? Uh, so understanding and strengthening those networks uh, was also one of the goals. And then, as I mentioned, disseminating and scaling up. So our long-term research area is 11, which is South Asia. We chose India and Nepal. Uh, it also includes Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, and you know, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh are the two primary countries in that South Asia region of interest. Uh, we're doing upland agriculture, so uh, rice is a major staple crop in both of these countries. But we're looking primarily at upland systems where they're growing crops like maize and millet uh, and a variety of uh, vegetables and other things like that. Um, very small subsistence-based farming, although subsistence, I say subsistence, but uh, they do sell a lot of the crops, at least some of the crops that they grow. So it is an income generation for them, not just a, a, a primary food source. 
Uh, India and Nepal are both monsoonal, so they have a, a wet season during the summer months and into the fall, and they have a full on dry period beginning around uh, December through uh, usually June. Um, it's a maize-based cropping system in both countries, so that was a nice overlap. And actually throughout the LTRA regions, maize is a primary staple crop being grown in many of these areas. Uh, multiple crops per year though, um, so normally they'll have a, an early season and then a late season crop. Uh, in Nepal, this is especially the case. Um, and they're primarily rain fed. So sometimes backyard kitchen gardens or other things will be irrigated. But the staple crop maize is typically just a rain fed crop. So you can already begin to see the implications for climate change and weather variability on you know, small scale rain fed agriculture. Uh, they use traditional crop varieties. They're relatively low yielding, but they're resilient in the sense of you know, pest diseases, uh, available water. So they, they, they make that tough trade off between yield and, and hardiness. Uh, very low chemical inputs on their staple crops. Some of the vegetable crops do, do get uh, a fair amount of pesticides because they have to be marketed. And that is actually, a, um, that's more of an integrated pest management concern, but it's outside the scope of this study. Um, and fertilizer is primarily farmyard manure, uncomposted, just tossed right on the surface of the soil. Very unsophisticated type of practice and is one of the reasons for uh, continuing low yields. And where you have continuous maize, you can imagine the kind of demands it puts on the soil without much fertilizer. So, yeah. so, so besides maize, do they have any other crops uh, that they hit upon, you know, switching back and forth? You call it. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, so the objectives of our pro uh, project were to determine the set of caps that would be suitable, suitable in each of the uh, locations. We wanted to explore the, the stakeholder preferences before we made any final decisions, as well as to get reflection based on, once they have experience working with them, kind of how their preferences or uh, perceptions might be changing over time. Uh, we wanted to promote reflection evaluation towards an adaptive management approach, and then obviously build capacity. So essentially align our goals and objectives with that of the, the Sandra and Chris. So this is where we're working. Orissa is a state in the central part, uh, central east part of India, so it is a coastal state. But there's a, tr a, a significant amount of area that's, that's well inland. And so where we're working in the Kendajar district is about 11, well, the villages are about 1,100 feet elevation, so they're a little bit cool at night in the wintertime, which is kind of nice, you know, the heat of the day. Um, it's uh, hilly land. Uh, a lot of interior Orissa is actually heavy, uh, a, a large mining area, bauxite for aluminum and iron and coal. So that's actually a, a big social economic development issue is that some of these villages are sitting atop very rich mine reserves and so there's those kind of pressures to, to utilize that resource you know, versus the farmers and the access and, and use of traditional lands. Um, the, they're tribal ethnic groups. So India still has what they call scheduled castes and tribes. Uh, this not so much in a, a it, it's not a discriminatory practice, it's a recognition that these ethnic groups, much like minority groups and indigenous groups in the U.S., continue to lag behind in terms of economic development, education, and other things like that. So there are special government programs to support folks in that area. However, almost all of them fall in the what they call below poverty line or BPL, socioeconomic class as well. So they kind of have two special designations which provide certain government support and attention, but obviously means that they're well behind even the rest of, uh, of society. So even though some of these villages aren't really that geographically isolated, when you enter the village, it's like stepping back in time or stepping away from, you know, uh, just really stepping away from what you see just in the, in, you know, a few miles down the road in the city. So this is what, yeah. What was the basis for the choice of the? the... Uh, we were looking for these kinds of characteristics. And so with the help of our, our partners at the Risa University of Ag Agriculture and Technology, they helped us with the actual selection of the villages to work in. So we said, you know, these are the kind of characteristics, these are the kind of producers we're looking for. And they said, OK, we have some experience working in this district with, these, with some of these villages. And in fact, we didn't get to work in all the villages we wanted to just because of, there's still a, um, malice, unrest in certain parts of India. If you read any of the local or national Indian papers, there's still those kind of, there's kidnappings and rebel groups and, and things even in, in India uh, that, that preclude folks like us from just wandering into those villages and doing work, especially our students 
you know, we didn't want to leave them out there uh, unattended during the summer. So uh, pretty low infrastructure. They do have basic electricity. Uh, they do have a central road running through the village that the government has built. They do have a government school that just goes through primary school, but pretty low, pretty poor, pretty low in terms of infrastructure development. In Tentuli Village, this is the well. This is the source of water for drinking and cooking and washing. It's a tube well, but it's a hand pump. Uh, the, in other villages, richer farmers uh, who can afford a diesel uh, generator and pump um, can uh, do a tube well where they can actually irrigate. But they'll also just do what's called a dug well, which is just big, a huge pit all the way down to the groundwater level, and they'll just pump out of that as a source of, uh, of non-potable water, irrigation water. This is the way they plow. Uh, two bullocks, and, a, and basically it's just a single time plow. So it's not the moldboard plow that turns the soil, it just sort of cuts through and scratches the surface of the soil. And this is what the field looks like in preparation for planting. We were about two or three weeks out from the monsoon season, so they do a preparatory plowing in, in preparation for the first rains, and then they'll, they'll seed the crops. Uh, this area in Tentuli, the, the areas where they do the, the actual farming is relatively flat, low slopes, less than 5%, but it goes right up next to the forest, and they will, if things are not so great, begin clearing the forest, terracing, uh, and actually beginning to plant crops on these. Uh, so they'll encroach into the forest, create terraces, and begin to slowly clear it so that it looks something like this. Uh, and it's kind of a rough hewn type of agriculture where they'll, they'll sow a few hardy crops. Uh, the primary focus is below, which you can see, where they're building up terraces to do just kind of sloping land agriculture. All of this is technically illegal, which is kind of why it doesn't look nice intended, because they're kind of just trying to do it opportunistically. Uh, they do recognize the problems that this occur that this causes. They they see a recognition uh, in terms of uh, reduced uh, groundwater recharge and stream flow during the dry season uh, with the clearing of these uh, hillsides. So they recognize the watershed implications, but it's just a, it's a tough choice that, that they have to make sometimes. In the even more uh, degraded type areas, um, you have these very old red soils, uh, a high iron content. And in these dry, baking suns for months after months, you get what's called laterite, or ironstone. Essentially, it's just a, a baked clay, high iron clay. It's just an iron cementation of the aggregates. And so that thing is as hard as a brick. It, it is basically a rock. And in fact, they make bricks out of this stuff just directly. They just carve it right out of the soil, shape it, bake it in the sun, and it's, it's building material. Nothing else needs to be done. So soils, when they're degraded and the, the topsoil washes away and it leaves behind this material, it's useless pretty much for farming. So in India, when facing these kinds of issues, we decided to look at um, what were the conservation agricultural practices that would be preferred. Well, we could sit down and just have, you know, talk story with them, but there are techniques for sort of doing this in a structured way. And so one of them is called um, analytical hierarchy process where you have a basic goal that everyone agrees upon, you decide upon what the objectives are for achieving that goal, in this case, uh, profit, uh, yield of the crop, uh, saving in terms of labor, and improvement in soil quality, or sort of the environmental aspect. And then you look at particular conservation agriculture options that will uh, provide different levels of positive or negative benefits to each of those individual goals. So for example, reducing your tillage might increase, might reduce labor in terms of the tillage part, but might increase labor with respect to having to weed, because that's one of the major re reasons for weeding. Um, uh, adding an additional crop increases the labor with respect to having to cultivate that crop, but it can increase the yield and potentially the profit if the crop comes to fruition. So by providing these different combinations and scenarios, we can find out what the farmer preferences are. So obviously we weren't the ones doing it because they don't even really speak Hindi, they speak Oriya, which is a more local language. So we had our local collaborators doing the interviews. Uh, but essentially what we came up with was um, a set of practices that included a, a standard conventional tillage, uh, which was just cross plowing of the field, a minimum tillage practice, which is kind of like a strip tillage, just kind of or a chisel tillage, right into the planting row. The standard crop was just sole maize, uh, and then we did an intercropping rather than a, uh, an actual uh, crop rotation. 
Uh, we talked about crop rotation, like, no, they can't plant maize every year, they're not going to go for it. So we said, all right, can we interplant cowpea, a legume, in between the maize, which would sort of be somewhat analogous to sort of a, a, a maize soybean rotation in Iowa or something. In this case, you would just intercrop them and grow them at the same time. And then in India, if there's any water left in the soil after the end of the maize period, they will, in this area, at least, they'll plant mustard. The oil is used, uh, mustard oil is, uh, is used a lot in uh, cooking and in uh, making sauces and curries. Um, and, but the mustard, of course, is then harvested, uh, and so the crop residue is pretty small. And if they leave any crop residue in the dry season, it's open grazing. So during the cropping season, the wet season, the animals are herded and kept away. But in the dry season, there's no cropping, so the animals are allowed to just eat whatever's left. So our issue with cover cropping was, first, they wanted to use mustard rather than something like horse bran, which didn't have a lot of value. And two, they weren't just going to let this sit fallow where the animals were going to run over it. They couldn't afford to keep, keep, keep them off of it. So what we decided to try was, OK, they're going to harvest the mustard. They're going to thresh it to remove the seeds. We're going to have them keep that residue. And then right before the rains come the next year, they spread it all out. It provides the soil cover to reduce the, the rainfall impact. And maybe that will give us a similar kind of an effect. So you have to think creatively in some of these situations to meet the local needs and preferences. So this was kind of the, the combination of treatments on the farm. On the station, we were able, the research station, we were able to do a full crossing of all of those treatments, so kind of a, a two to the third power, so eight different combinations, plus looking at different kinds of cover crops. On the farm, because of limitations of space and sophistication, we decided to use more of an additive treatment design. So we end up having uh, basically four treatments uh, on the, well, four caps treatments plus the, the standard farmer's practice on the farm. Uh, regardless, the farmers are fairly receptive, and so we got about 20 households in that one village just the first year. Uh, what we saw from that in terms of crop performance was that the intercropping provided um, an additional yield over the mix. The maize yield really didn't, wasn't affected too much by tillage. It didn't seem to go down because of the competition with cowpea. And so in the first couple of years, what we actually got was uh, the additional benefit of cowpea to yield an income was both really positive and encouraging. Um, and so by using what we call a maize equivalent yield, which is a way of standardizing everything by maize, we can see that adding the cowpea, um, in this case maize plus cowpea in both the conventional and the minimum tillage, was much higher than just doing um, cowpea by itself. Um, and so looking at the different cover crops, uh, if this was a second year effect, the effect of cover crop on maize yield, we could see in the no cover crop or fallow, you know, we're getting about the same yield as we did the year before. Whereas with coarse gram and mustard cover crops on the research station, we were already beginning to see a significant benefit of a cover crop to maize yield. So the farmers weren't really receptive to the idea of cover crop initially, with these kinds of results, we're hoping their perceptions and acceptance will change by showing really having the value of this, not just environmentally, but even in terms of crop yield. Um, so minimum tillage plus intercropping had the highest labor requirement, but most of that was because they had to harvest the cowpea. So the increase in labor was primarily associated with cowpea. The, part of the reason for that is cowpea uh, yields throughout the yield of the season. Maize, because the grass comes up, it fruits, it dies. Cowpea is kind of an indeterminate crop, so you have to kind of go through every week and pick, and so that was part of the labor issue, but it provided a, an additional income, and the per unit weight market price was higher than for, for maize. So it, it's a, a, the, one re the, the only main reason they don't use this more commonly is it is subject to sometimes the pest outbreaks. But in the two or three years we've done this, it's, it's done quite well. Uh, with soil quality, we've seen positive trends, but nothing significant. It's only been a couple of years so far, and so that's one of the reasons uh, the Sander and Crisp has been in these five-year phases, recognizing it takes a few years to get results that, uh, you, that we think would be beneficial. But just from the effects of the cover crop, I think it's going to be apparent in this final year that uh, we'll, have, we'll see some significant improvements in soil quality. Uh, in Nepal, 
Uh, we're working in uplands as well, but it's a much more severe type of situation. This is true terrace farming, sloping land agriculture. Anyone who's done international agricultural work in these kind of areas, uh, Africa or South America, or any, any of the regions that Sandrin covers, uh, will sort of recognize this, this, this kind of uh, severe type of marginal land agriculture. But the same kind of uh, sociocultural groups, they're, uh, they're fairly poor, small farmers, subsistence farming, tribal ethnic groups. These are smaller villages primarily because of the, just the geographic location. So it's in this general area, the Mid-Hills region, this pink region, or sorry, the Midlands, uh, this uh, kind of region along here. There's a, the Trishuli River kind of runs right through the middle. And so there's one main road coming out of Kathmandu that runs along here. And then in these mid hill, there's uh, steep hills all around that uh, river, and that's where a lot of the, the sloping land agriculture occurs. Once you get up in here, you get up into the Himalayas, and there's agriculture kind of fades away, and it's more into ecotourism at that point. Um, so this is kind of how they do agriculture in this region. On the river bottoms of the, the low slopes, uh, they'll do rice, uh, they'll do legumes, they'll do um, some maize, cowpea, and other uh, millets. Uh, in the steeper slopes, 20 to 45 percent, that's when they, they'll do some vegetables, small scale, but mostly maize, cowpea, millet. And on, on the highest slopes, greater than 45 or 50 percent, they'll do a lot of tariff. They'll still do maize, um, but they'll also mix in things like finger millet, which is a, a very low demanding crop. Um, it was a food staple for a while. They're beginning to move away from it. Um, but uh, there's still a kind of a local preference for, for finger millet. Um, and then there is actually some shifting cultivation as well. The picture is given to you best. This is the low slope area here. So rice paddies, vegetable farms. You can see these uh, vegetable terraces here along the, um, uh, the kind of the um, away from the riverbed. Uh, this is a typical kind of, this is what the river looks like. Uh, at the end of the dry season in March. They get a little bit of rain in March and April for our first cropping season. So you can see they're doing some irrigated uh, vegetable farming here um, along these uh, low terraces. Uh, but what you can start to see up in the hills is a lot of terrace farming here. This is the problem right here. This is agriculture in, in the mid hills of Nepal. I mean, this is, I, I was thinking that the, the the Hawaii analogy, this is all forest reserve in Hawaii, you're not allowed to touch it, right? This is agriculture in Nepal. And people live up here. And this is a this is a long walk down to a market, to a road, to somebody to pick up and sell your vegetables or anything. And it's walking. They don't have these suburban. There are no llamas, there are no donkeys here. It's just on it's just foot power, people power that you up and down these hills. So uh, working with uh, a local NGO there, uh, they identified several villages that met our criteria, but really we're going to get you in shape if you're going to visit them. Um, and so we decided to do some of the same kinds of things in terms of uh, uh, determining farmer preferences and coming up with caps. This is what it looks like from the homestead. Um, so anywhere there's enough space in these upper terraces, they'll put in a house, they'll put in a, a, a corral for the animals, and they'll just, they'll just, you know, they'll tear us. They actually tear us from the top down. Because it's typically tends to, the, the slope tends to round out at the top and it gets steeper as you go down. So they'll just tear us all the way down until it's so steep they can't even walk. And so this is kind of what it looks like in March uh, from the top of one of those uh, small mountains. This is what the soil looks like. It's pretty rough, uh, very fairly stony as you might expect. Uh, the pH is not that bad, but uh, nutrient concentration, you know, water only capacity is fairly low. Again, you can kind of see that cross plowing that occurs. The terraces are only a few meters wide, maybe about four or five meters wide at the most. Um, the terraces are mostly just dug out of the side of the hill. There's not much reinforcement. Uh, these trees were planted here, you know, to help keep this terrace in place, but you can see they use them for fuel wood and for fodder. So it's a dry season fodder. So the, the trees are themselves are not in great shape. Um, I took this picture and I'm like, I wonder what that slope is. So I tried to align my camera. That's, that line right there represents 45 degrees. That's 100% slope. This area is not terraced, but what they do is 
slash and burn, broadcast may see, harvest whatever comes up, and it's just one and done, one year and done. This is the real, I mean, this is also a problem because areas that not are under active cultivation are under the shifting cultivation. So not only is it, um, uh, you know, degrading the natural vegetative cover, but you're also trying to get a crop off of it. So this is the kind of thing we're trying to avoid. There's only one road, I told you, down the river. Our village, this village we visit is on the other side of the river from the road. The road doesn't go down the middle. So you got to cross the river on foot. It's, it's the old swinging bridge kind of thing. It's not so bad, really. Um, but coming back can be even more fun. Uh, this, this is uh, the way we came back. So we kind of went in and came out of, around the other side of the mountain and, and crossed the river back uh, this way. This is a lot of fun. Uh, and this is kind of the way they get goods across, too. So you can load up a, a bunch of goods across or something like this and get it across in a few minutes uh, to the other side. What power is that? Uh, that woman and her son, they pull, pull it out. They pull it. Now, if you have a big team, once you get on the other side, the folks on the other side can help get you across. But those two right there are the ones who get you across. They're, well, yeah, yeah thick is, is one way to put it. Yeah. Uh, and so you do a couple people at a time that way, back and forth across the river. So things go slow there, for sure. Uh, we chose a, a, a similar set of, of uh, cropping systems, but in, in uh, Nepal, they have an early season, a first season, and a second season. And so the second season is when they typically do millet, and they'll do a maize followed by millet is their sort of conventional practice. And so placement, or the <coughs> intro millet plus the legume, and then uh, mix in both conventional and what we call a strip tillage or, or reduced tillage. Um, so again, you know, adjustments based on the local preferences. Uh, a little more exploring preferences. 